I'm good. Um, okay, so you get started. Um, what was your role at Adams? What was my role? Yeah. Well, let me think. It was so complicated. Uh, what, what do you know about the school um, right now? That would help. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I've i read about the the house system of like, mm-hmm. the schools within the school. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the idea of kind of the general education classes mm-hmm. and the vocational elective classes. Mm-hmm. Um, See, I, from, from what I've read, you know, I kind of got more like a normal school as time went on. This has been how it seemed. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I'm trying to think what would be most, most useful for you. Um, it was, it was in the beginning, schools within a school. Uh, I think there were, well, they called them houses to start with. And uh, so my role there, as it turned out, I, be, I went there as an English teacher from uh, Lincoln High School. Mm-hmm. And um, I was interested in the general education part of it initially, and that's what took my fancy. And uh, as the years went on, I went more and more into the um, development of teachers. So then I became a a half-time at Portland State and half-time at at Adams. And and at Adams, I had um, a, a, a half I guess you'd say a half a school by the time that the school closed um, with uh, three teachers and I doing the general education program. And we had a heavy emphasis on art and uh, literature and things like that. And I'm sorry, my voice is really creaky, creaky this morning. Oh, that's fine. <clears throat> um, so I guess you... But I was always uh, very involved with the uh, uh, teacher training and then uh, with the uh, development of curriculum that went along that way. So I had a complicated role, maybe more so than a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, anytime you have a question that's not clear, well, be happy to answer it. Uh, could you explain like how in an average class in the general education would would be structured? Okay, how how we did it in the in the small school that I was the director of. The, they use the word principal. I don't know if that's correct anymore or not. But that we had a heavy emphasis on the arts, and uh, but we had a, an excellent. Uh, teacher who was a math and social studies teacher and a, a woman who was a fantastic art teacher, myself, and then a woman who was a science teacher. So we would blend, we would choose a topic and we would uh, make a blend of those um, parts of the curriculum and each one of us would give our input <clears throat> into that. And sometimes we would have individual classes that would be short, you know, or smaller groups. But often we would have a big group with all four of us interacting at once. And it was really an interesting dynamic. Uh, And I think, I remember particularly, we were were studying um, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. And... uh, these were kids who had never had any Shakespeare before. So we started with the film. None of, and we didn't tell them anything about what Shakespeare was like or anything. And then we showed the film, the Zeffirelli yeah. film, Romeo and Juliet. And they were in tears, you know, because wow. it was so realistic to them and their age and everything. And, uh, and so from that, we 
moved into the dynamic of actually understanding what what the um, Shakespearean language was like, what it meant, the metaphors, etc. And um, and that was in a big group. That's one example of our all teaching at once, which was really good. The we had the the students also all kept journals, uh, and we. Uh, divided into groups, into four groups, and uh, but we didn't only read one person's journal. We read uh, our one group's journal. We read often read a lot of them. We had lots of celebrations because this is a part of Portland that was pretty. I would use the word, I guess, underserved in many ways, and so. Um, they we tried to bring as much beauty and art and promise into their lives as we could. And I think one particular example for me was a young man who he wanted to go to Adams and he was outside the school limits, so he lived in a friend's chicken coop so that he could go there. And and he was a, a tough kid, I would say, but I managed to squeeze a scholarship for him at Reed. And so he went to Reed and became a very good, well, he majored in Greek, actually, at Reed. So it was it was looking, from my point of view, now that I recall, we were looking at the potential for every every student, every student's gifts, rather than a rigid curriculum. Yeah. How did the how did the community react to Adams? Well, which community are you talking about? Because it drew from, anybody could go there from the city. Uh -huh. So we had a lot of students who came from the Lincoln area and so forth. Uh, you mean how did the media community or? Oh, were there different reactions for in different, different parts of the city? Uh, at times there were. Uh, I would say that probably the um, people who live in the close neighborhood didn't understand it as well as maybe some people outside. Why do you think that was? Well, I think that the the kids who came from the Lincoln catchment area, for example, came because they wanted to, an, uh, an opportunity to, to take advantage of some of the things that uh, were there. They recognized what they were, or their parents did, and uh, the people, the immediate community, was more used to a traditional school. And there were, in the beginning, there were, I would say, that in general, the staff was pretty iconoclastic, so that, um, you know, we weren't as respectful in some ways as we could have been to the feelings of the community. But I would say that my particular group of teachers and myself, we always tried to include the parents. In it. We would have potlucks, we would do a lot of things to bring the families in. What were some of the, the clashes between the iconoclastic teachers and the parents used to, to rigid school? Well, um, I'm trying to think of one was the um, I think it had to do with uh, having a class, a flag in the classroom, or or not having a flag, or saying the Pledge of Allegiance, or something like that. I don't recall too clearly, but I know that it was something that was traditionally done in a school, and we didn't do it. <laughs> I don't. I'm not too. My memory's not too clear about what exactly that was, but I do remember having a grandfather come into my class and, you know, upbraiding me for for something and uh, I managed to charm him enough that he became quite a positive force in the school after that. But uh, And there was another problem that the clashes were because we absorbed students from Madison, uh, maybe Madison, when they had to divide up the student body and how the, the catchment area that was going to be the school. And uh, the 
kids who came from Madison were uh, the toughest ones to deal with. They were because they had they were at the I didn't realize it at the time, but they were really a gang, and so they were out to do mayhem for a lot of the reasons, you know. They didn't want to be there in the first place, so, yeah. From what I've read, like, students quitting class was also kind of a problem. A cutting class, you yeah, mean? Yeah, cutting class. Well, um, yes, I guess. I think that's probably true of a lot of schools. Uh, I certainly remember that at Lincoln, kids, depending on what the class was, trying to get out of it for one reason or another. Do you ever cut a class? I don't personally. I mean, some people do. See? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, didn't enrollment like drop a lot yeah, until did. the end of that? Yeah. Why did that happen? Well, all the reasons that you're asking about. It was difficult for the community to understand. I think there were, um, well, also the school district itself, the administration of the school district changed radically when, from the planning time of Adams to open to the actual uh, development of it, uh, had a total shift in um, the upper management of the school district. And they were very conscious of of uh, money and and uh, perceptions of the public, as opposed to the man who whose dream the school really was, who had retired, who he developed the whole program and then <coughs> and then retired. <coughs> so when the school opened, we had this other person who um, just said, "You've got to put in more hours. You've got to work harder." <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> um, and so, like, what sort of what sort of things did the staff do to try and like stop the enrollment from continuing to drop? Well, um, again, it depended on the, the individual schools, the individual houses, or by that time, I think we were calling them schools within a school. Um, they were trying, at least in our situation, we were working, trying to work with uh, um, what we saw as, as students who were having trouble working with the families, that kind of thing. And we had a very good counselor in our, in our group. And uh, so that was one of the things I remember that it was a matter of trying to enlighten the... For example, we had students that had never been in downtown Portland. They'd never been across the river. And so some of the things we would do would be field trips to the museum downtown, the art museum, or to plays or things like that to broaden their experience. And we took, at one point, um, 15 students cross country on the train to New York, Chicago, um, Williamsburg, and so on. Things like that, that we tried to really broaden their experience. Have you ever been on a field trip with your teachers? Yeah, we have some. Where do you go? Well, last year we went uh, with our English teacher and our science teacher up to Mount Hood to watch the salmon spawn. Uh-huh. Um, I know they don't do many field trips in high school. Uh -huh. I guess it's harder to schedule or something. Do you think it's a good idea? I mean, I, I think people learn a lot from yeah, that. I do too. I still think it's one of the best ways. Yeah, with my own, <coughs> my own children and my own grandchildren, I've taken them to Europe and everything because I just think that it's in this part of the world, we could be, live a very narrow existence if we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. What are some ways you saw the, the field trips, the cross-country ones, 
shaping this view. And so. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it was hard, but we did it. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the struggles? Well, actually, we had two parents along, or myself, I, myself, and and our science teacher. We were the major um, faculty leaders, but we had two parents who were uh, uh, volunteers to go with us. They were the toughest ones to handle. The kids were not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. We had school on the train, you know. So yeah. it was great now that you're reminding me of it. So what are some of the ways that, that Adams changed from the its start to to its end? Well, it's, first of all, I think I would say that we did not have the support from the district officials that we had in the beginning. We also had, um, I don't rem I know if you've read or there were four doctoral students who came from uh, Harvard who were the developers of the program. This is part of their doctoral work. And they almost all left except one. And, you know, that was... Uh, and in some ways they left us hanging, I would say. So we had to figure out for ourselves, but it was a very democratic faculty. All of our meeting, all of our um, decisions were made by everybody in the faculty. It wasn't just a few people. That, and uh, I would say it's because they left and didn't fight for the program that they really, if they had believed in it, which is hard to say whether or not they did, you know. So we had a series of principles that were maybe in step and maybe not. Why did the original founders leave? They were there a year. They were there the, the planning year and then the first year and then a, a couple of them left and then Two stayed in the area, one stayed in the school district, and one uh, went out to, uh, uh, what's the school in Pacific Grove? Um, University, I can't remember. But he, he died too, so that's part of it. You know, it was, it was life going on, but we didn't have the support from the entire um, administration in the school district. I, th I would say that was the worst part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, are you open to more questions? Sure, yeah. I have until yeah. a quarter to twelve. All right. <clears throat> um, so, from what I've read, was there like is there like some sort of fighting or something in the in the opening days of Adams? Fighting? You mean? With, between students? Well, I told you about the students who came from Madison, who came in a group and were, it was like a, we didn't realize it, but that they were actually a gang. And, and the, um, what we finally had to do with the leader was to get him graduated early and forbid him to come back on the premises because as long as he was there, he'd rally these ne'er do wells to. I shouldn't call kids ne'er do wells, but they were they were a tough lot, and we had to get him out of there. Yeah, and we did. Yeah. Um. And and didn't Adams also like? Refused to have a rose queen mm -hmm. one year. Yeah. Why was that? Well, I can't remember why. Maybe it was undemocratic. I don't know. There were a lot of, 
we were trying hard to deal with racial issues, with um, trying to help young people see that um, that uh, it was an important question to be talking about, and uh, and part of it was the equality of why would you choose one girl over another to represent the school when uh, yeah, uh, and I still well, this is for publication. I still think the Rose Festival Queen is a you know, for some girls it may seem wonderful, but uh, because I, one of the princesses, in fact, one of those years was from my block in East Moreland, and we, our kids had to all call her Princess Anne, you know, and it was just, I don't know. I personally hate that kind of thing, so, yeah. but that's a personal thing with me. Uh, in what ways were you were you trying to get kids more aware of, of racial issues? We would have actual discussions, particularly about language, uh, and uh, uh, pretty open. We had a lot of, uh, of um, African American faculty, and we were trying to learn from them ourselves because, you know, it's a... I had come from Lincoln at that point, as I said, and Lincoln was very stratified in terms of, of uh, at that point, not now, as I don't think it is now, uh, because if you were, many of the kids at Lincoln were bused from the Albina area because their parents thought they were going to get a better education, but they would put, be put in a lower class simply because of their color of their skin. So that was one reason I left Lincoln to go to Adams because I, I tried very hard to, uh, I taught those classes and I tried very hard to elevate their curriculum and, and fought for getting them into the regular classes and so forth. That's another whole issue. If you ever want to make a film of that, I would be happy to do that um, because I, I did, um, just go out on a limb professionally to, to tackle that problem. And to this day, that's one of the major issues in my life, is yeah. the racial issue, racial justice. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about what, what you mean by going out on a limb to tackle that? At, at Lincoln? Yeah. Well, we're talking about Adams, though, so, so I carried I, when I went to Adams, I was one of the oldest members of the faculty, and uh, I think that was one of the reasons that they included me, because I had such strong feelings about uh, the issue of race, and uh, uh, working at it, you know, diligently as long as I was at Lincoln. And um, uh, so language helping young people to see how harmful language can be or how helpful it can be. Also, um, the ability to work together peacefully without an uproar of any kind is important. And, uh, and we had some wonderful, wonderful counselors at Adams that were uh, African American and uh, really good to help us see when a, a, a black student would be hurt, emotionally hurt, and we couldn't recognize it, you know, so it was, a, that was a, a real gift to me personally, yeah. yeah. Um, And after I left, and after I retired from uh, the school district, then I've carried that on. That's my real passion is working for racial justice. I still do it. Yeah. What have you done now? 
Well, I'm uh, very active in my church, and um, I, uh, uh, as long as I was driving, I was uh, volunteering at a school in uh, Northeast Portland that's a community transitional school for homeless children, and those are mostly children of color. Um, worked with the uh, um, immigrant workers, the men who stand on the corner looking for jobs, that kind of thing. Um, taught English to them. Never stops. What are some other things you think I should know about Adams? Well, uh, there was an opportunity for students to learn many or tackle and, and um, tackle uh, ideas, tackle projects that maybe they wouldn't have anywhere else. We had a greenhouse and we had a science teacher who encouraged kids to come into the greenhouse and use it and see that jade plant over there. Yeah. One of my students gave me a little piece of a jade plant like that for Christmas one year. That's that jade plant. Wow. <laughs> it lives a long time. Yeah. It's a real <laughs> artifact from Adam's days. Um, um, my close lifelong education and friends were from Adam's. Um, uh, think what else you should know. Just that there was a closeness between students and faculty that is, uh, you know, I, I don't see it anywhere else. It may exist, but the curriculum that are, are um, I think it, at Jefferson it may very well still be that way. But, um, I think the I don't want to get into a political thing here, but the attitude that you can just structure the kinds of educational systems that you need and force kids into it is uh, you know the, the, in terms of meeting certain benchmarks and so forth. So do you have editing equipment at home, too? Yeah, I've just been using iMovie hmm. for this. Um, can you spell your name for me, just so I'm... J-E-A-N. Yeah. R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. -S -S okay. That's what I thought, but you know, it would be bad if I got it wrong. <laughs> and it... That's good. Good reporting technique. All right. Um, okay. So one thing that I've been, been trying to understand with with Adams is like why there were so many magnet schools across the district at that at that time. It wasn't really a magnet school other mm -hmm. than at least my understanding, other than that students could come there from any place in the city. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know why. <laughs> um, I think part of it was trying to integrate schools that were more in minority um, mm -hmm. neighborhoods. And there was a high minority um, student population at Adams. So this brought kids from across the river and from Lincoln High School, from Wilson High School areas. Um, There's just a really incredible mix of students. So. Mm -hmm. Did you work with with any one like school within a school? Yes, I started out as a secretary for Quincy School, which um, Jerry Conrath had started, and then his former wife had been killed, so his 
children came to live with him, and he didn't feel like he could continue being the director of that school, so Sid Burt became director. Sid Burt lives right up on Wisteria, at least the last time I talked to him, just about 49th or 50th in Wisteria, so he's close by too. And he was the director, and he's the one who hired me as the secretary. And um, then I became a teacher. I'd already graduated from college, but I'd been out of school for many years while my children were long, young. And um, so I was hired as a teacher like two or three years later. And I worked with Mesereau School as well. Dave Mesereau was the director of that as a secretary. And then by the time I started teaching, they had done away with the schools within a school. So. Did they still have the, the general education mm -hmm. idea then? Um, well, I'm not sure whether that continued so much after. I don't think so. I think students were just assigned then to English and social studies. And they didn't have the interdisciplinary studies that they had with the schools within the school. So the last three years, it was no longer schools within the school. Yeah. So why why was that that they got rid of? I think my own idea is that the school board probably decided it was too much money because the directors each got um, more salary. And then each director, I mean each school within the school had a secretary and a counselor. So there were all these extra folks on the payroll. And I think that was one of the reasons. But I thought it was a wonderful, innovative way to teach. I feel like it helped me become a better person and taught me, gave me a lot of self-confidence. And my children were all students there, as I told you before. Um, and they certainly learned um, getting along with people of all backgrounds. So. Can you tell me more about like the self-confidence? Um, I was just in the process of getting a divorce at the time, and I felt pretty beaten down. I hadn't, um, hadn't really worked since my marriage, and um, so I, wasn't, I didn't feel confident to teach. Um, but when I worked with the Quincy School within a school, we had a meeting together with all the, those teachers, including me as a secretary, and what I had to say was listened to with equal weight. I wasn't considered um, a lower class citizen because I was a secretary. And it gave me just a, a tremendous amount of, of confidence in what I had to say and, and um, then, of course, the purpose of the meetings every morning was to plan what was going to be taught in the interdisciplinary studies and also to cons be, um, be aware of any problems that were coming up with um, different students, you know, that because they all taught the same students. And so a kid was having problems in all of their classes, then they brainstormed things that they could do to help that student. And interestingly enough, after Adams closed, a great many of us were transferred to Jefferson, not a lot to, Marsh, uh, to Madison. But um, Julie Crosley was one of the teachers who was at Jefferson, and she had been at Adams. And she started what they called the Academy at Jefferson, which was very much the same thing as a school within a school. And those students that came into the academy as sophomores were um, uh, uh, nominated, kind of, by their freshman teachers as this kid is struggling with high school and needs help. And so they came in, we call it the Financial Services Academy. And so they had um, English and math and social studies and business. We taught them business classes so that they would be prepared for careers in the financial services. And 
that I was I taught in that group till I retired. So that helped a lot of kids. Um, so these these meetings, did you say those were, were every day? I think they were, if I remember right. Every morning, you know. Um, seems like it. So I guess it was before the students got there and didn't last a long time, but you know, just, just check in and and it just I still remain friends with those people that I've worked with and longer than than you know, it just is a friendships that developed that were very important. So, um, I don't know, how were, I'm kind of curious, like, when Adams became kind of more of a, a conventional school, how did, how did students react to that, that transition? We, were, we had marches, we walked out, we had all kinds of things that, you know, just to, to um, object to it, that the school board was doing this. And then when they closed the school in 1981, that was a terrible blow. At the same time, they closed Jackson um, High School the same year. And <coughs> excuse me. So it was, um, students were very disappointed. And some of them from across the river didn't come back or, you know, they went. I think that the uh, district was losing um, enrollment. There weren't as many students going to public schools then, at that time or something. I, I don't know, you probably read, like you said, the yeah. archives of the Oregonian, so um, I don't know what you said in there. Yeah, I mean, I read Adams lost a whole lot of enrollment. Like, the end, from what I've read, it seems like it was like at half capacity. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Because it was, it was getting smaller and smaller. One thing against the schools in a school it was more like competition between the schools, and they didn't have the, uh, uh, the you know, like a grant, the, the, the cheerleaders and all that stuff for the, they didn't have the camaraderie for making a cohesiveness and, and pride in, in Adams High School so much as within their own schools within the school. So that, that was a one thing that was not too good. What are some of the results of that like, competition and lack of cohesion? Well, I just think part of the, one of the results was that it, that the school didn't didn't uh, coalesce to become um, a school of pride in in the whole. But there, there wasn't really competition in terms of academics or sports or anything like that, but getting a sports team to work. Dave Dampy was the football coach, and it was hard to get kids out that really <laughs> were competitive. And um, I can't remember whether we ever had a rally, pep rally or not before a game. It doesn't seem like it. I don't remember. I guess they were cheerleaders and stuff. And didn't the, the schools also have different focuses? Uh, well, I don't know. Have you read that? Um, for, I've, I've read that like there is there were like you know, college track schools hmm. and like comprehensive ones. Huh. Well, I guess I wasn't aware of that. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, hmm. Don't know. Yeah. Um, so why, why was enrollment dropping so much at Adams specifically? Well, there was unrest in the black community during those years in the 70s. And um, I think people maybe didn't want to 
part of it was, you know, the location was far away from the center core of the city. If it had been at Benson, for instance, I think a much more centrally located school, it would have attracted more students from across the city. And um, so I think that was one reason. And once the kids came from other schools, just areas, they may not have felt that comfortable in the in the neighborhood. Um, there was a lot of drug use. I guess that happens every place now too, but it, it just seemed like it was not, it was kind of lax in terms of the discipline regarding it. To me anyway. <laughs> smell of pot in the halls in inside the school. Why do you think the discipline was lax? I think they were trying to, part of it was to, to make students self-aware of their own ability to discipline themselves and not be a crack down, crack the, crack the whip on, on them for teaching them how to monitor their own behavior. And a lot of a lot of learning was supposed to be going out on their own into the city and and doing their own field trips or you know kind of learning off campus just and and developing their own um, interests what they wanted to study so I think that they were just trying to allow students to have learn how to do it on their own without saying no more, you can't do this. How effective do you think that was for students? Well, it wasn't very effective for a lot of them. And uh, one of my sons in particular, he got into drugs pretty heavy duty and he suffered from it a lot. But, but it took him a long time to get clean and sober. So. <coughs> was that while he was at Adams? Mm -hmm. But he was close to 30 years old before he finally got sober. What was it like going to, to teach there after that happened? Pardon me? What was it like going to teach at Adams after that had happened? Um, after the schools within the school. Or after after he had the problems with drug use. Oh, well, he, he was had graduated by then, so mm -hmm. I didn't start teaching until after he was out of school. Um, Teaching was fine. It was also time at Vietnam, and we became the um, the school where the people from Southeast Asia that were coming in came to learn English. So we became the um, the magnet school for all of these students from all over the place. And I had a class of typing with forty five students in it. And there were 27 different countries represented by the students. And so I had one boy um, who was Lao, who was pretty good at English. And so, um, well, I'll go back to that later. But what I did was put an American student next to a foreign student um, in every place so that they had partners, and I said the only responsibility for the American student was to make sure the student, the foreign student, was on the right page and just point out what page. And then I taught using an overhead so that I could draw pictures and so forth to tell them what they were supposed to be doing. And then when I had tests, this, this young man from, from Lao, from, uh, no, he was Mung, he wasn't Lao, he was Mung, and he translated my tests into Hmong, and then um, somehow I, I got him translated into Vietnamese as well as Cambodian, and so that you know, they could read the tests. And many of the students went on to Jefferson after they closed Adams, and so I had a lot of those students enroll in my classes because we developed a rapport with each other. And, they're really incredible people.
but it it was really difficult, you know, and they were just immersed into English. So that was happening at the same time. How well did they they blend with the the rest of the Adams community? I think fairly well because they kind of developed a little bit of a rapport with the American students there and and that was one of the things we talked about was you know respecting one another for all the differences you know, that we have in the world and and uh, just seemed like I mean I suppose that happens in most schools any now but but I think it was especially pronounced at Adams A lot of my questions are about like the beginning of, of Adams. Yeah, and I wasn't there for yeah. the first five years, so so I don't know. I think they had a lot of headaches, there were a few a few divorces because people that were trying to teach there were trying to get it off the ground, was really working eighty hours a week, you know, and ignoring their families. Quite a few teachers came from Grant. Are there other things that, that you remember about your time at Adams that you think I should know? Well, I just felt like it was the most, the warmest staff and the, the most embracing. You know, people, people really loved each other. And like I say, I've remained friends with many, many of them. I see Dave Damke and, and Jenny DiMaggio and Tom Swanson, and once a month we play dominoes together. You know, it's just it's just remaining my good friend Connie Sparrows, who lives in Scappoose. We've traveled together and gone lots of places and see each other at least once or twice a month. Um, I see Mary Bothwell. She goes to the same church I do, and and uh, she and I traveled in Europe in the 80s um, after Adams closed. We went to Europe for six weeks. Good friends. So, um, what do you think made it so that you you like stay so connected? With well, I think because we had all these meetings when the schools within the school. Um, and, and we really got to know one another as staff members that um, our friendships were much deeper than just going to a faculty meeting with the whole whole group and sitting in rows while the principal talks to you. you know? mm -hmm. Colin Carr Morris, do you have that name? No, I don't. He was principal um, when Adams closed and then he became principal at Marshall. But uh, I think it's C A R R hyphen M O R S E. I don't know if he's still around. I'm sure he is. But he retired now. But he's somebody interesting to talk to. I'll look into him. Hmm? I'll look into him. Okay. If I can track right. him down. Uh, Let's see, well, in the yearbooks, you can probably see some of the teachers. The, the last yearbook is the green one. That was 1980. Or 81 is the, is the last one, but I don't have it. My, it's my daughter's class, and she has it. <laughs> yeah. So, if you wanted to borrow those and take them home, you could do that if you're interested. But I just want to get them back, of course. Yeah. Um, no. Anything else to say? I can't think of anything. Like I say, the fact that I wasn't there at the beginning, um, those people would have a lot more to say. Yeah. All right.
So how long were you at Adams for? From the beginning to the end. All right. And, and what do you teach there? Uh, well, I taught mathematics, and there's a thing called general education. And students took general education the first, first half of the day or the second half of the day. And then they took electives afterwards. So if you were, general education was to meet your math requirement, your English requirement, your history requirement, and it seems to me there were four items. I'm not sure what the other. So the school initially was divided into four houses, and the school then was split up. Um, the first year staff member were selected. In other words, there was a, not a department head, I forget what they called them, but the head of the, of the house. And each house, I did not have my own classroom. We had uh, a room that was designated for uh, the teachers. So it was kind of like a, uh, looked almost like just a long hall. And in the hall there were, everyone had a desk. So you did not have your own classroom. Uh, some of the chemistry and stuff teachers had a little bit, but not. And the building was divided in a situation where you might look for a, uh, a diagram of the building. Because in the middle, there was a huge open space on the first and second floor, which could be divided into four classrooms or opened up into one huge assembly room. So most of us were selected or we just, I showed up, I was hired and I showed up and they more or less started a bidding process. The head guys would pick out people that they wanted or they knew or they didn't know someone, they'd just say, you come on over here. So it was kind of a random selection. And we spent a lot of the summer planning the curriculum because it was what you called um, a module system. So in other words, if your class was three mods long, which was probably a normal school day, I mean, you know, what you do now, but if you had a two mod, the third mod, you could just leave the class and go out into the hall or to the library or outside or whatever. So there, there was a little more action in the hallway all the way during the time. And there also was a uh, open area next to these four classrooms. In other words, there were, and uh, so you could look down into this area if you wanted. Otherwise, it was you know we had one rectangle was more or less all the classrooms and the science rooms. Another leg off was the theater and the music department, uh, there was a cafeteria, and above the cafeteria was business, and then we also had all the shops. We had uh, uh, photography, newspaper, welding, wood shop, auto shop, and uh, let me see, and then the gym and the PE stuff was there, and then down into the basement. Mm -hmm. So, it was a, what is that? So you didn't necessarily take a math class in the situation where you were just sitting there. We designed a lot of the curriculum around uh, simulations, uh, interactions, so there was a lot of group activity. There was, if you were taking the gen ed credit, then you more or less were getting general math or whatever, because if you wanted algebra or uh, physics or chemistry, those were elective classes. So um, I'm trying to think one of the incidents or one of the things that we designed on the team that I was on was to help students understand the depression. So we, I designed a game of Monopoly but instead of having the, the, you know, the whatever, Broadway and so on, we s took the whole 
area and set it up with buildings and stores that were in Portland in the 1930s. So you played as a team and then you, you know, built your whatever. And then at one point, to illustrate the depression, we took everything away from a group of students. More or less like it was the crash and they lost everything. And so, in other words, there was a lot of interaction. We had studied and so on, but it was not as much lecture as, you know, I did later on or when I was at other places, but it was more how do you work mathematics into it. So um, sometimes we did a simulation at the time, what was it? Uh, now I can't remember, it was a, near India, uh, okay. remember. anyhow, where you got in and you had to deal with the disease that was coming in. So everything was, you did a lot of writing, a lot of journal writing, a lot of reading, a lot of group process and so on. It changed over the time because of people, it was so new that it was difficult for people and students to kind of adjust to it. Some students did very well, some found it very difficult and so on. We also had uh, a TV program, in other words, and I'm trying to remember, there was probably a lot more I missed, but it's pretty much a traditional high school uh, in the courses that were offered, but there was a little more freedom, a little more interaction, a little, you might call craziness from the outside, but students had a lot of, oh, I don't want to say free time, but they had a lot of choices that they could make. And I think eventually that gave them the ability to be much more, I shouldn't say the word adult, but could handle things. I remember being on a field trip, I don't know, at Mount Hood Community College, and another group of students were real crazy and goofy, and our kids just said, no, no. You know, it was like they were mature enough to be able to handle themselves, I think. I mean, you know, they're, they're but. Another thing that slowly, and after a while, the four schools, let's see, what was it? There were five PhD candidates or already had their PhD from Harvard. They designed the school. They actually designed part of the physical st structure of what they were gonna look at. And then it was their curriculum that they brought in and it was their design and for the first four or five years, uh, that's kind of what went on. It, it wasn't the word, it wasn't successful, because I think it was. Anyhow, the group that started it moved on. One was hired by uh, Kennedy to run or work in the education department. Another ended up at uh, Dean or was a professor at Pacific University. So they all, after about a four or five year period, moved on. Other people came in and it slowed. From four, we all of a sudden ended up with, I think, six or seven small schools. And three teachers, myself and two other teachers, formed a small group and others. And kids started then. Each team or group had kind of a personality. So kids went looking for the teachers that kind of fit their personality. So you had, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but there was a call a school called Quincy, which was really relaxed and so on, and they, they did some things that were really interesting, but it was much, I don't want to use not structured, but it was, um, oh, a little more loosely run. They did some things. The group that I ran was pretty structured in a lot of ways, but we also did a lot of simulations. At that time, we did things like Biafra. We did an environmental one. We did, uh, by that, you know, kids took on parts. They had to build up. So 
we could have spent maybe um, you know four or five weeks and so I write we ran a simulation one time I forget what it was oh we were running some kind of court and so I had some of my friends come in and take some students out of the classroom more or less didn't say they were arrested but say they had to so we tried to get the feeling and then how do you get yourself out of these situations and stuff it was during the time when LSD and a lot of other things were prevalent in the environment of all schools. Uh, they had a, a, a very good music program. The theater was one of their strong points. Uh, athletics was up and down. Uh, the one interesting thing was I thought that, that the school and, and this is just my opinion, that because after a few years, no ethnicity was predominant. You had Hispanics and Oriental, you had African American and you had white, but none of them were more than about a third. So no group became dominant, so they learned to get along and work together fairly well. I, you know, was, I don't know how to explain it and you had to be there but there was a much more better interaction between students because of the fact that they almost had, it wasn't that they had to but there wasn't one culture that was pushing something else and that's I don't know if that makes sense but it's something um, I'm trying to think it, it was a teaching style. It was, a lot of people had a difficult time with it um, because of whatever. But I think, and this is probably just mine, is that if you, a lot of the things with groups and houses and small schools, if you look around at some of the high schools here and other places, the idea generated out and people took it and did with it what they wanted but I think it was one of the first to try this idea where the high school all of a sudden became many high schools within and uh, I forget even I mean it's been a long time um, but um, I know when I went to Jeff we experimented with something similar to it Teachers went to other places. Uh, out of Adams came a program called Night School that was at Grant and was at a, where kids went to school at night. Or and it wasn't like Benson; it was pretty much different. And they eventually they were at Grant for God, a long time. Uh, and then, as most of us got older, the things that held it together kind of faded. But it was a program, the night school program started at Adams and continued over to Grant and eventually ended up at Benson. But it was designed to help students that either didn't like school, they had jobs or they had children or they had something that kept them from coming. And so they earned their credit going to night school. I think it was like from six to nine. And if they had a job or something, that part of the credit. So. Uh, let me just look through the book here and see if I can see. I don't know if I'm answering all your questions. It was yeah. The, um. And it, you know, there were. Well, I still run into students. Uh, well, like Larry Colton, who was the baseball coach, wrote several books about. Well, they were about other things, but he was a writer. Um, so it's, I mean, that just dawned on me here. Um, you know, in many ways, it was very much like a typical school. The teachers, I think, at that time, interacted more. Most of us were called by our first name. Um, 
I felt more comfortable. The kids would sit and talk and do stuff. Uh, I think some of them found it a little hard because it wasn't as structured as they were used to. And the teachers, some of the teachers decided this is not what I want to do. And so they would transfer out and others would transfer in. And something just crossed my mind and I can't remember. I don't know. Uh, it, I think it had an influence on education that a lot of people probably don't because when you mention Adams it has a very negative reaction at times with a lot of people. Really? Yeah, well, well, you went to, or you, you know, so it, it, there's an, in, not so much now maybe, but in the, in the days, whatever. Um, Why do you think it got that negative reputation? Well, because we were doing, parents got frustrated, I think, because we were allowing the students more freedom to decide and think for themselves. So they weren't always necessarily in line with where their parents or grandparents or whatever thought. Uh, a lot of it had to do, I think, with how we were teaching, the idea that we didn't have kids sitting in the classroom. That we were, they were asking, how can you teach things by having students interacting or dialoguing or working in groups or a lot of different things. And I think, you know, there was, it was just different and some of the people in the community had a hard time because it wasn't something they were familiar with. They were all familiar with a very structured, you know, I don't know what Grant is like now, but, you know, I go to a classroom, I take notes, I do my work, I turn my homework in. Well, maybe we didn't have homework. Maybe we assigned you to go out and on a field. We did a lot of field trips. I mean, and I think, like I mentioned to you, later on, probably after this period, almost every house took their kids someplace. Magruder, uh, I took our group to D.C., uh, San Francisco. We went up to Holden Village a couple times. All of these was in the spring. So usually two thirds of the kids would we'd raise money or whatever and and go and then if you couldn't go or didn't want to go you would teachers from the other houses would cover for you so they we didn't hire subs and stuff so it all worked out so uh, so I got to know my kids and you know like taking a train all the way across the country with thirty or forty students you get to know them. I mean, like, uh, one of them had some money and we stopped in Cheyenne, or trained it, and he saw all this cowboy stuff and he spent all his money <laughs> right there. So all of a sudden he had the next week and a half to figure, well, he called his parents and they sent him money. Um, we were in Chicago and we rode the uh, L and that was new for most of them. We walked by a high school when we were going to the museum the big in Chicago, and kids from the school of Lake, they did yell at them, and it panicked. So, I mean, there's stories of... The trip we took was mainly the kids. We had got a grant for art, and so we saw a play in a church basement in Chicago near Wrigley Field. We saw a play in Philadelphia, and we stayed in New York City. I think we saw, oh, what is it? I think we saw Chorus Line, and we also went to the Kennedy Center. So that kind of experience, you know, was, I think, really good. And we had some parents that came along, too, so it was... I think most of the kids that went through there did well. A lot of our kids went into college. One of the interesting things that caused some hassle was instead of giving you a grade, I would write 
out for every one of my students what they had done, where they were at, and so on. So you would get a written evaluation and not an A or a B or a C. And that definitely didn't go over well with parents because they wanted, is my kid an A or a B? And the college just didn't like it because they couldn't classify you. You know, well, this student, you know, they couldn't do it. They couldn't grind the numbers. So eventually, we kept it up for a while, but eventually, uh, I think we switched to grades. But I may not be correct, but we asked for a day off to do the writing. And I think out of that, eventually, all schools got the chance to have a day off to do grades because we said there's no way we can sit and write evaluations on 100 students and so on. I think in the long run, the written evaluation was more valuable than the grade. I can understand colleges not wanting to read all this stuff and try to interpret it for kids. I think there were some things we could have done better. There are some things that definitely the criticism was valid. But I think it was a it was an interesting time, and I learned more about teaching there than probably well each school provides you stuff. But it was uh, you know there are stories upon stories about kids and what's gone on and so on, and um, you could eat in class. We had pop machines. I remember we, I think I was one of, there was a machine that you could get coffee, pop, or whatever, and I think it cost a dime. But having everybody, we managed it ourselves, or a guy by the name of Marsubian did, and within a couple, I think within a year, we were able to buy a minivan out of the profits of the pop machine so that now we could drive students around using the minivan. We eventually had an old school bus where we could do that too. And it, it was, it, they were just different things. Uh, when Bruce, which he eventually ended up being the drama teacher at Grant, but he was, when he was at Adams, he involved a lot of the teachers into the play with the students. So, so what was it? I was, football coach at one time and they did oh god what was it I forgot the play but anyhow I was a bartender and had to throw this guy out of the bar so there was a lot of us just you know I could never act but it was interesting and so you would usually have staff and students working together in the play so it was it was very interesting and I think we learned a lot as the teachers spread out over the district. They brought some different ideas to different schools. When I went to Jeff, uh, a lot of us went to Jeff because a lot of the kids from Adams went to Jeff. Uh, we started to do some of the things at Jefferson, too, in a little different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, it's most of the things I can think of are stories, you know, about people, about students. Like the one of my remember right now is Tim Hibbets who sat in my class and he now is, a, when the elections are on, he must work for some statistical operation because he does all the predicting of who's going to win and who's going to lose and so on. Um, it, we had a lot of different workshops and stuff for us to talk out things and so on. And the interesting thing, some teachers, like I said, couldn't buy into it, so they said, yeah, I'm not going to go. Others of us, I think, found it fascinating. Um, but I think we were different enough that a lot of people had a hard time adjusting. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, building isn't even there anymore because it got uh, mold, I guess. So they took it down. But <clears throat> the interesting thing is this eclipse that's going to happen 
it happened, I remember taking my students out over, you know, where there's a track there looking because the ellipse, eclipse happened at that time too, I think, back in the early, I'm, I'm not sure, but I remember, you know, the eclipse happening and the whole, all the animals and everything, it was just dead silence. So I, The connections to students were really strong. I think you knew all your students. Well, the other thing was that the kids on the team or the house or whatever we were calling it at the time, if you came in as a freshman, you stayed with us for four years. So you had some instructors that you knew for four years. So we knew your parents, we knew you, we kind of got to know everybody pretty well. And I kind of liked that. I mean, you really knew kids. Mm -hmm. But we had the usual problems of any high school. And, and But I enjoyed it. It was probably, I came from a, high, a junior high in Minnesota where I taught uh, what was it, ninth grade social studies, which was Minnesota history, and I had five classes, and they were arranged from the so-called lower, so they were tracked, and uh, so I'd have five classes, the lower, lower track kids came in the morning, and then you got the afternoon, supposedly the better students, so I did, I taught the same thing five periods a day, and then kept on doing that for two years, which at that time I thought that's the way you would do it. I don't think that that is the way that kids are going to really learn, I think, by interacting. Granted, you need some structure, but even in all the mathematics that I did, I become more and more convinced that you learn by working in groups and stuff. And I, oh, for I know it's probably about 10 years. There was an institute down at Oregon State where a lot of teachers from all over the state of Oregon were involved in kindergarten, or not kindergarten, yeah, I guess elementary, middle, and high school, working together to try to figure out how to get kids to problem solve and work together other than just listening to someone lecture. So, I mean, we did lecture and we did that, but there was a lot of I think that's what I was looking for too. We all wrote activities, simulations, and things where students, and then once it happened, you had to, like that incident about the depression, the students got really mad because they lost. So in other words, they had a feeling for why in the 30s all of a sudden you had all this money and we're doing well and instantaneously it's gone and you could understand why people jumped off buildings and so on. And we did some environmental, I remember them getting mad at one of the teachers and carried him out of the room. I mean, it was, they were, we had, I don't know, it, they were interesting things kids could do and didn't feel as inhibited, like I was someone above or below them. It was just, in most cases, we were friends, but we, you could get along, but you also knew where the, the line was most of the time. I don't know, it's by trying to figure out what else I can, yeah, mainly it would have to be specific questions that you would want to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that, that I'm kind of unsure on is like, why did they go from the four houses to the more, more school? houses? Well, I think some moved on, and some of us, well, it was kind of like each, teachers had different ways they wanted to teach. I went together with an English teacher and an art teacher, so a lot of the things we did, like when I said we went back to drama and stuff, our, we got the core, but our, our emphasis was more on one thing. Another group, was 
the personalities of the teachers and so on, I think, split up. I, you know, to be honest with you, I can't remember why we did it. I think new administration came in. Teachers kind of wanted to go their own way, like in the group that I was in. There were eight or nine of us, and three of us one put together a team. A couple didn't put together a team. They just taught their science. We had a couple leave because it wasn't something they wanted to do. So it it was a transition, and I you know I'd have to go back and talk to my friends because I can't remember why we split up, but. It may also have happened when the those that had built the program moved on, and you got new administration with new ideas and so on. But yeah, they. I can't. Let's see if I can take a look here. You would think I spent my whole life there. And no. What groups? Graduates. Yeah, you think about it now, these folks are in their 50s. Okay. Okay, there's the administration. General education. See, this is my group back in the time. Then this is another one. This was another, yeah, okay. Damwell, uh, really Anderson. Quincy, Claire, and Mesero. So each of these split up into six and more or less kind of formed different groups. Uh, these guys were, you know, they may have had more African American students. Uh, these, this was Quincy, these guys were a little, uh, I mean, if you looked at what they did, you would say they're crazy. Uh, this group was kind of traditional. This group was all the jocks. Um, this group here, which was this, Bucciarelli, he eventually, I think, ended up at Cleveland High School. So anyhow, uh, each group's personality then started to draw students. So you would probably say, oh, geez, I kind of like those guys that work. So you'd go there. Mm -hmm. So I think it was mainly uh, people, after having been together for a while, realized that, hey, we work together better, and so on, so they just started splitting up. And then some of them moved on. But, no, I mean, I could tell you that the personalities of each of these groups are definitely different. So you would look for teachers you think that you would kind of fit with. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were... Well, I don't know. Don't want to say too much or I get myself in trouble. Uh, yeah, they thought Quincy was way far out. We were probably too conservative. These guys are crazy. Uh, this was a little more calm. And Harold's group, where is Harold? Well, see, even there, then you come back a couple days l later and you'll find that or years later that someone else has taken over the group, too. Mm -hmm. Was that uh, you? I don't like Gen Ed because it's not organized. Debbie Miller is okay. Is uh, that, that student stuff? That, those are all quotes by students. So there you get an idea. Students had a hard time. They, they wanted things right in a row. So they would probably go, if they wanted them right in a row, let's see, probably to this group here because they were a little more structured. We were somewhat structured. These guys were really, kids really loved this group, but they bonded with a certain type of kid. And Peter was kind of a crazy guy in, in some respects, but he was, you know, he was the wrestling coach. He and I coached football and some other things. But he, he eventually ended up in Alaska and uh, I think he actually ran for House of Representatives or something at one time. But he was, you know, so there, there are all kinds of, you know, and even here are people are gone from what uh, I remember. So, anybody 
knocking on the door. No. So we had teachers, huh? Yeah, I don't see anyone out there. Yeah, no. yeah, probably. And the administration changed. Like this Don Holt was new. The He came in and some other people had moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as it changed, the... the oh, other, I think someone's here. Okay, time to go. Yeah. We can talk out. Hope you're animated. Um. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, what was your role at Adams when you were there? Uh, my my role at Adams was not as a uh, classroom teacher. I came to uh, Adams High School uh, when it opened uh, to be part of. Uh, of a group of uh, men and women who were preparing people to teach. Uh, so there was at Adams High School at that time, in addition to the uh, general education program, uh, there was also a uh, group of people working within what was called the clinical division. Mm -hmm. The clinical division uh, was a group of uh, uh, men and women who were doing two things. They were either working on pre-service teacher education programs or they were gathering information to support teaching and learning. So it was a research division and it was a training division. It was a group of people whose backgrounds were in either research or in training. And I came up from Oregon State uh, to bring uh, with me uh, my doctoral program uh, and the relationship that I had with the School of Education at Oregon State University so that students who were enrolled at Adams High School with me uh, could receive their degree work through Oregon State University and I had that relationship uh, to deliver coursework from Corvallis to Adams so uh, um, we had a, a large number of uh, students. Uh, some were bachelor's degree students, some were master's degree students, some were social work candidates from Portland State University, some were as far away as Boston, Massachusetts, who came to Adams High School to experience an urban, uh, unique educational environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was not a teacher. Uh, I was a uh, I was a university professor who was involved in uh, in helping people acquire their degrees and learn how to teach. Mm -hmm. So what would, would they be like student teachers? Some were. Some were student teachers from Portland State, from Lewis and Clark, from Reed, uh, from uh, University of Washington, from Oregon State, from University of Oregon, uh, from Willamette. Uh, others were uh, men and women who were uh, already degreed and were receiving bachelor, master's degrees and uh, certification uh, to, uh, to teach. So I had uh, 22 interns every year uh, for seven years that I was at Adams, um, uh, preparing them to receive their teaching certificate and eventually um, become employed in the Portland Public Schools as either middle school or high school teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary worked with me some, uh, Dave Damke worked with me some, a number of people worked with me, or I worked with them, depending upon how you, how you view it. Uh, but all of us, many of us were involved in a very serious um, uh, teacher education program that was an embedded and a significant part of Adams High School. And not, and not a part that often gets recognized because it sat kind of off to the edge of the school, but was a prominent component of the school. Mm -hmm. So is teacher education more of a role in Adams than it was in other schools? Uh, teacher education at Adams was probably more of a role uh, for two or three reasons. Uh, one, uh, Adams High School received 
really a significant amount of funding uh, to support uh, in-service and pre-service teacher education programs. So, the, so there were resources there, human resources and material resources. Uh, beyond that, the uniqueness of the school itself served as kind of a magnet uh, for students who had an interest, a really distinct interest, in being at Adams rather than being somewhere else that seemed more traditional or more usual uh, because of the nature of the experience and what they thought they would gain by being there. And that was the second reason. And the third reason was that Adams High School was connected to a whole series of middle schools and elementary schools who were part of its regional uh, relationship, uh, feeder system. And in that context, Adams High School was a very prominent leader in helping middle schools and elementary schools in Northeast all be involved in pre-service teacher education and internships and student teachers. And a lot of the resources that supported those student teachers, including the training, the supervision, and all of that, came out of the staff that existed at Adams. So, in your mind, how would you, how would you like, define the the Adams mission? Um. Well, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, in fact, that's, uh, that's a keen question. I, I think I would define it in, in several ways. I, I think Adams High School was very much attempting to uh, create a new kind of pathway that would explore at least the potential of students becoming much more involved in their own education. It was a student-centered environment. But it was also a place that spent a lot of time and energy becoming involved in helping staff members find greater opportunities to work in distinctive and in sometimes really unique ways with students that wouldn't have been available to them in traditional classrooms. So a lot of time spent in traveling, a lot of time in the field, a lot of field trips, a lot of special opportunities that took students and staff uh, into remote areas of Oregon, into the urban center of Portland, uh, and engaged them in kind of uh, on-site learning. And I think that was a part of a mission. I think a third thing that was a part of a mission is I think that the Adams High School believed that it had a professional responsibility to prepare people uh, because of the unique setting of Adams to prepare people for positions in either teaching or school administration, uh, in part within Portland, but uh, regionally and nationally as well. And then I think it had uh, a, another mission, uh, which was to make sure, to the extent that it could, that it explored ways to combine uh, content areas from across disciplines into a more collaborative, uh, interrelated uh, uh, curriculum uh, that required development. And so part of it was a, a development theme, you know, getting involved in creating, uh, in creating instruction that was interdisciplinary, uh, that was non-graded. Uh, it had a very strong commitment uh, to uh, written evaluations of student performance as opposed to letter grades. So we blocked big chunks of time for teachers to spend uh, time writing what often were very lengthy uh, summaries of student achievements. Uh, very personalized, uh, very uh, uh, very thoughtful, and very time-consuming uh, as, a, as a commitment to, to, uh, to say to a student, uh, if you're enrolled here, not only are we going to support you with a distinctive curriculum, but not only are we going to make it possible for you to be more effectively engaged in helping to design your own instruction and your own program, 
but we're going to make a commitment uh, to support you in very distinctive and significant ways, uh, in very personal ways. Uh, so there was a very uh, strong uh, element to the mission which was uh, highly personalized. How did the, the student teachers that you were working with respond to that, that highly personalized school? I, I think they responded in, in one of two fairly distinctive ways. They either were enormously invigorated by the opportunity and took to it uh, engaged in it and uh, and loved it, or they found it uh, disarmingly difficult, uh, problematic, and it placed them in a position which was too personally risky. I mean, there was risk involved, because when students were surrounded you in that way as a teacher, um, in, in, in the informality of the environment, uh, the uh, ever-presence of students in really distinctive and highly personal ways. Uh, for some, it was really engaging, and for others, it could be, at times, terrifying. It was uh, too much disclosure, if that makes any sense. And that's true for students as well. It wasn't just an issue of, uh, of uh, staff reactions. I think it was also an issue of student reactions. Mm. So some, for some students, that was like too much, too much disclosure from the staff. I think it was. I think I think there was a whole range of things involved from the standpoint of students. Um, it required each student to work very hard and that degree of requirement for some students was was more than they intended and so there was a pushback for some um, for some um, it was or could be a kind of frightening place. It was a racially diverse. Um, there was a kind of um, uh, presence within the student body that for a uh, young white male or female could be frightening and was at times. Uh, and, and I think that, um, that for some students, the nature of the uh, staff itself wasn't something that they always found it easy to relate to. The, uh, 25 students in a traditional classroom was for some students a safer environment. I mean, you knew, you knew how to navigate. And at Adams High School, it was, it was more complicated and it was more difficult to understand how to effectively navigate on any given day in any location. Um, if I'm a student, in a 25 student classroom in rows with a teacher in the front of the room I know what that environment's like I know what the expectations are and I know what I have to do as a student to feel to fulfill those expectations I'm familiar with that I grew up with that um, put me in an environment that looks a lot like a farmers market and call it yeah. a school uh, that that's a, that's a different environment to try to navigate
and for some it was enormously engaging and very appealing and for some it was really unsettling. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that some students pushed back against against this, this new system. Mm -hmm. In what ways they do that? Well, I think they, they chose to go to other schools. Uh, so there were some students who uh, who left Adams in favor of going back to a more traditional environment. Uh, there were some students who um, who kind of skated on the edge of the environment and did um, disproportionately less than others um, in order to kind of get by. Uh, there were students, I think, that kind of hid out uh, in the corners of the school uh, so as to be less observable, maybe to feel safer. Um, and I think there were also students whose parents were concerned about Adams High School and acted out some of their own parents' anxieties, um, sometimes vocally, sometimes physically, uh, sometimes by leaning in and sometimes by falling back. What are some of the parents' concerns? Safety was a big concern for many parents, uh, whether the school was safe whether if my son or my daughter went there, I, uh, he or she uh, would be safe at all times, whether the staff was capable of ensuring student safety uh, was, I think, a big parent concern. I think there was a big parent concern about whether the staff <coughs> knew what they were doing. Uh, because the school was operating in such a non-traditional way, it was it was an unusual experience for a parent as well as for the student. It didn't conform to the view of what a school looked like and how it acted, and it was inconsistent with their own schooling experience. And so there was uncertainty at times, given the lack of familiarity. And there was, at times, really vocal criticism that was very hard to overcome. It was very hard to overcome. And it was ever present for a population, for a segment of the, of the schools uh, students and for a segment of the school's parents. Yeah. What did the, the school do to try and overcome that? Well, I, th I think they worked for, uh, I think they worked very hard uh, to um, to connect with parents. They had uh, staff members uh, who were working there full-time whose uh, responsibility was just simply to develop uh, working relationships with parents, uh, to communicate effectively with parents. There were parent gatherings, there were activities that brought or sought to bring, parent, brought, bring parents into the school environment. Uh, there were lots and lots of meetings that the school staff had that were invitational, please y'all come uh, so we can talk about what we're doing and what we're planning to do and we can answer questions. Um, there was a lot of information that was printed and being sent home to families uh, to explain uh, different things that were taking place. Uh, and all of the activities that involved taking students out of the school on trips and whatever all required student uh, parent permissions uh, along with explanations of why the trip was taking place, what they hoped to achieve, why they were going to the particular place they were going. Uh, who was going to be there, what the staff supervision patterns would look like, etc. Uh, so those were all uh, patterns of communication. Uh, but when you find yourself as a school 
subject to parental concerns about safety. It is a very difficult thing to counter. To counter. Because part of it is real and part of it is imaginary. And it's very hard to deal with either of those two things. Um, the um, And there were incidents, in truth, there were incidents that caused parents to feel enormously anxious. And it caused staff to feel enormously anxious as well. Um, because of activities, because of react, because of things that were happening that did happen, um, that that tended to signal appropriately or inappropriate, that tended to signal that um, that at times the school could be or could feel unsafe. Um, the school closed for three or four or five days. Uh, to try to put itself back together again after a series of incidents uh, that happened inside the school where 1,600 kids uh, on one afternoon um, flew into the hallways and started fighting each other. Scary stuff. Uh, kids were hiding. Some staff members were hiding uh, because it was... It was it was frightening, and um, police cordoned off the school, surrounded it with, uh, and uh, students struggled to find ways to communicate with their parents about what was going on on that day, how they would get home when they would get home and whether they would safely get home and whether they were safe. The uh, communication technology uh, at that time <laughs> a great deal different than it is today. Right. You know, not everybody had a cell phone. Uh, so that uh, the difficulty of communicating with parents a great, uh, a great deal different then than it would be today. Uh, but that said, uh, an, an event like that, um, you can argue, I think that an event like that lasts forever. It, it's, it's certainly more pervasive than just what happens in the moment. It lasts, it lasts, it lasts, and it takes on a life of its own, and you always if you're on the staff, if you're an administrator, you're always fighting against the backdrop of those incidents. And you can't ever remove the school entirely from those realities. They just are part of the gestalt. They're part of the culture. They're just baked into the school in an enormously unfortunate way. And you left with the challenge of trying to say yes but. What caused the fight? Two young men fighting out on the outside of 42nd Street off of Killingsworth. One stabbed the other over an event. Maybe it was drugs. I don't know. There was a girlfriend. I don't know. But the young one of the youngsters um, who was stabbed ran into the school bleeding. Others saw the incident. It, uh, it uh, came into uh, 
the school down a corridor and it triggered uh, it triggered an enormous reaction uh, of enormous volatility um, then you put you put some portion of 1600 students out in the hall um, fighting each other and hitting each other and kicking each other and staff members out trying to stop little groups who were engaged in that um, and, and up and down quarters and up and down two different levels um, very difficult it's very difficult and um, and it conspired to some people's existing notion that it wasn't safe and there was an example that they could point to that demonstrated that belief. I imagine that was a major part of what, what caused people to pull their kids out of the school. Yeah, I think I think it was a contributing factor. I think it was a contributing factor. It was, I, I'm not prepared to say it was the most significant factor. I think the uh, reasons for some parents and some students choosing to leave the school are pretty varied. The, uh, worry about safe and secure I think was an element of that and, and not every student and not every student see part of the part of the problem that Adams had um, that, it, that it struggled to encounter and struggled to respond to uh, was that it was a very unique school that was trying hard to be a neighborhood school it wasn't an option school. It wasn't a magnet school. It was a neighborhood school. It was like Wilson or Grant or Madison or Jefferson or Roosevelt. Uh, it was a neighborhood school serving an attendance area as a school that was radically different and struggling on the one hand to remain radically different in ways that it intended and on the other to be a school serving an established neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, like other high schools in Portland despite the fact that it was completely unlike any other high school in Portland. Yeah. Uh, that was an enormous challenge. And it seems like over time they they had to give up some of their radical difference. Uh, over time, they did give up some of the radical difference. Uh, over time, the school became more like other schools um, became more like other schools and there were a variety of reasons why I think that happened I'm sure Dave mentioned some of them and Mary mentioned some of them and we required information from others about the thoughts about why that happened but it clearly did yeah it clearly did You're feeling up for more questions? Well, we got, sure, another another 10 minutes or so? Yeah, okay. I'm fine, you know, at least for a moment. Yeah. All right. is, is this helpful? Yeah, this is really helpful. Okay. So, um, what, would, what are some ways that you saw the, the school succeeding in its goal to 
to kind of give students more of a, a voice in their, their education? Oh, I think, I think for some students, the school itself was enormously powerful and impactful. For a student who felt confident uh, and capable of um, engaging in uh, critical parts of his or her own education, of taking the lead, of being somewhat aggressive uh, with respect to what they wanted and needed to do, of understanding um, how that worked and what they and what they needed to do to make that work. Um, I think for, for, for some students, uh, the school was just, uh, was just an extraordinary place. I mean, where, where young people uh, just simply uh, blossomed, uh, became, um, became uh, invigorated, became um, engaged, became enormously excited. that would have been completely, uh, completely um, contrary to what their school experience would have been like if they had been enrolled in any of the other Portland high schools. Um, and, that, and it was just, it was just the most exciting thing in the world for some kids. Um, and it, and it led to uh, going on to uh, colleges and universities and excelling, probably um, continuing to excel as adults uh, wherever they are living today. Um, and Adams, uh, and Adams um, played a big, a big part. And individual teachers and groups of teachers at Adams High School played a big part in that uh, positive experience for students. I mean, there were uh, teachers, teachers at Adams uh, were um, in many cases just extraordinary individuals. Uh, I mean, just extraordinary individuals. Uh, totally, totally committed uh, to trying to help every student that they came in contact with experience something really special. They were, they were, they were really extraordinary teachers in, in almost every case. Um, but, but there's a point, there's a point where you can't continue to deliver With that energy and with that effort, day in and day out for ten years, I mean the burnout for teachers was significant, um, and and teachers experienced a number of them experienced real life changing circumstances because of Adams experience and the responsibilities that they felt they had and had to and had to bear there were a lot of divorces there were a lot of things that happened individually to staff that reflected a pattern of just burning out these were these were these were not six or seven hour a day jobs at Adams these were really demanding jobs that were. I, I have no many, I have no idea how many hours a, a staff member spent in a typical week at Adams High School, but it was a lot. It was a lot, and for some, that kind of intensity, that kind of duration. That kind of always being available combined with the need to create completely kind of curriculum just for some.
took its toll. Took its toll. I imagine that was really rough for the brand new teachers who were working with. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was. It was. It was tough. Um, it. It it challenged them in ways that were unexpected. Because they came into a school setting from their own experiences with a set of expectations often that didn't match the realities of this environment that they found themselves in. Um, there wasn't a traditional curriculum with a syllabus. There was whatever curricula 28 kids at any given moment needed, yeah. wanted, maybe even demanded. Uh, and, the, and the need to try to figure out how to respond and to respond appropriately and to respond sensitively and to respond distinctively and to respond in a timely way. And to do it in collaboration with other teachers was an enormous instructional challenge. It was, it was an enormous instructional challenge. It was, it was all of the dynamics of a marriage in terms of communication, collaboration, problem solving, working relationships, dealing with stress. Dealing with, I mean, it was it was enormously dynamic environment. Some people handle it well, and some people handled it less well. And that was true for students, and it was certainly true for adults. Thank you so much you bet. for giving me your time. Senator the editor of the papers of the New York Times, Senator Hackwood, guys running the main banks downtown, all of that sort of thing. Oh, there were 3,000 students. 3,000? Yeah. Wow. That's huge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I remember one uh, senior class that had over 700 people in it. Wow. Yeah, I have a big. We're packed in there. Well, how about got you interested in atoms? Um. Well, I, you know, my parents are teachers, so they've yeah. talked about the, the Whitaker building a whole lot, um, especially especially around, you know, closing down and all the problems. Um, so then I just kind of got in, into researching that a little bit, yeah. um, and then I, I found out about Adams. It, it just really got me interested. What, uh, what were you interested in about it? In particular, well, I'm interested in the the program there, and also just trying to figure out more the the dynamics of what what kind of brought it to to closing down after such a short time. Yeah. It was still. <laughs> Still standing, it's probably the newest high school building in the city. This is the last high school building. Jackson was built just before. Do they still call it Jackson? Yeah, Jackson Middle okay. School. Yeah, well, Jackson yeah. High School. And um, that went up in 1966. That was came along in 69. Uh, yeah. 
So if you've got questions, you know, yeah. you just have yeah, um, a bunch of questions in line. Yeah, I have some questions. questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so and we, I don't I don't guarantee you that I know anything yeah. in particular, but I happen to be on the scene. Yeah. So were you were you there the whole time? Yeah. Day one till day the last. Uh, <laughs> And what, what did you teach there? Well, uh, English. I'm uh, basically an English teacher. I also am an art teacher, but I did not, I taught as little art as possible. I could have teach in high school English. Yeah. Um, and so I was talking with Tom Swanson. Mm -hmm who had said that the first week or two was, was kind of rough and that kind of shaped the, the image of Adams. Yeah. Can you tell me something about that? Well, uh, yeah, that was a really interesting day. Um, the first day of school, the weather was sort of like right now or like yesterday. Yeah. It was at least 95 degrees. Might have been uh, a little longer than that. And if you're really interested, um, if you look in the old newspaper files of the Oregon Journal, or the, uh, well, the Oregon Journal, especially. You know about the Oregon Journal? Yeah, I looked at some of their articles on, on, the, on Adams. Okay, did you look at the one about the opening of Adams? I don't think I, I don't think I did. What well, was that today? Oh. And big headlines, you know, like riot at New High School and so on and so on. Things like that. Uh, there was some chaos. One of the things that seemed to happen was that, uh, well, New High School. And there's a lot of publicity about it. Uh, it didn't go open solve all the problems of the river in secondary education. And um, the school was built to hold like about 400 students. And uh, ordinarily, you know, when school opens, uh, the administration has gotten everybody registered, more or less everybody registered. No two supposed to be there and everything. And you know, have school. You're still Grand High School. In September, you go in and you start. Well, I'd say at least 2,000 people showed up. This overwhelmed the place. It's like a beehive. And um, the halls were full of kids wandering around just sightseeing. And um, there seemed to be a lack of awareness uh, about what was going on among the powers that be. And uh, in the afternoon, sometime in the afternoon, you know, uh, I don't know if we call it a movie or not, but the report went around that there had been a fight between a couple of students, and maybe a standoff. And it turned out to be more or less a room. And uh, I never saw any uh, any action like that. But uh, there was a lot of milling around and yelling, and, uh, speculating on what went on, and so on. And then uh, the newspaper reports. Uh, and the school immediately became a problem. The image of the school. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of confusion there. Also, um, there was a lot of time spent afterward <laughs> among the people at the school, the administration, and students and teachers trying to figure out and explain what actually went on. And uh, 
I still to this day don't start noticing. And it didn't, it didn't seem like much. But uh, the big thing to me it seemed to be all the confusion. Like the, uh, the whole overwhelming number of students who showed up. Well, I would call the students. Uh, most of them didn't, didn't belong there. They hadn't been enrolled. They were just there. And uh, the school was not prepared for them. And just the overwhelmed environment was uh, uh, the most spectacular my experience. And I had, uh, I wasn't new to school, but I had been teaching. And, uh, several years before the internet So the so why why wasn't everyone enrolled at the beginning? Well um I can't say specifically. I'm not an. I'm, I wasn't an administrator. It's an administrative thing. Um, I would say the administration was uh, overwhelmed. Uh, they were also inexperienced. Uh, <laughs> they didn't. My impression was they didn't know what hit them. Uh, you, you know how Adams got started? Yeah. With the, the Harvard graduate students yeah. getting together to make the school? Yeah. Um, this group of uh, young I don't know if you said A, uh, graduate students from the Harvard Graduate School of Education had this idea that they saw the uh, school district on for a Certain type of high school organization that they had worked out and believed in, and they offered uh, Adams High School building to, to do it in, start this new high school program. And, uh, uh, I'd say that the inexperience, their inexperience, did not help with that situation. So all of these things, and uh, the pupil accounting system was not up to the job if they even had one. Uh, you know, knowing who's there, and who's supposed to be there, is where you start. Yeah. And uh, uh, something that I don't know exactly. Uh, but uh, yeah. It was an interesting mess. So, in in your mind, what would you say was the kind of the goal of Adams? Like, what what made it different? Well, um, the goal of him. <laughs> One of the uh, one of the notions uh, that they had about the organization was to uh, have different levels of staffing. I think the term was differentiated staffing, and uh, so that the school was uh, organized into what they called four houses. Four houses. Uh, this was the beginning, it sort of shifted over the years. Four houses. We had the principal and his vice principal at the top of the office. Then you had these four houses. And uh, each house was, um, um, I was going to say, ruled, led, <laughs> led by. Uh, a master teacher who was not, um, who was not a certified administrator, 
the people who started the people who started the uh, project had great intentions, but uh, they got off to that bad start from which I don't think it ever recovered image wise. And then, you know, there were problems, and you know, some of the problems that you know, you've probably seen at the Grand High with the demographics there, and we were in a fairly sizable uh, minority population, black students. And ever uh, since I've been in Portland, uh, the school district has not really. The district has not really been up to doing, doing anything sensational educationally. There, there's been uh, there's been a lot of confusion, a lot of confusion. And I have to say, I don't see Portland being much different than any place else. A lot of places are. A whole lot worse off than Portland, it seems that way. So, a big city school district, we have uh, say, a large black population of students in the public schools. <coughs> and uh, uh, lots of the country just have, have been able to deal with it. You watch sports, for instance? Not really. Okay. I was, I was going to say, you can see, the, it's so obvious, you can see the uh, educational problem if, if you, if you say, uh, if you're looking at TV, sports fans don't pay much attention to it, but as a teacher, I do. Uh, say in, bas in basketball, in uh, all of the Athlete, you're black, right? Professional basketball. You've seen that. Yeah. Um, and most of them have been to college, supposedly. Been to college. Uh, they listen to those guys in the interview. Um, well, I may be a little uh, stricter as an English teacher, but I learned what language are these guys speaking? I know. I, I understand it. I understand it. I understand their language and their uh, orientation. But um, uh, I can see, it's to me, that they have had um, they have not had much education, schooling, that would enable them to get along very well in uh, uh, the business of uh, maintaining oneself in American life, so to speak, in the economic system, you know, job ready. Uh, skill wise and everything, so that you can get a job and you can communicate with other citizens um, uh, adequately uh, and um, do okay. Do okay. I'm not talking about anything spectacular. Um, um, which is to say, um, I see a lot. Of, I have seen and still see a lot of the same kind of problem in Portland in the school system. Um, I don't know if that relates to the question uh, that well, but I um, don't want to get out of the soapbox here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I see a lot wrong. I saw a lot wrong in Adam. Yeah. Uh, I still hear the same. Uh, it's all nonsense. Um, uh, in the Portland public education scene, but it's nothing new. Uh, 
So did you did you see any of what you're talking about with the, like the basketball players? They get Adams. <laughs> How does that? I don't know. I'm trying trying to draw a no, connection. No, no, please, please ask your question. And don't, yeah, don't 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 be shy. Speaking out at this point. Um, yeah, you know, it's, um, you mentioned the basketball thing. Um, I um, happen to uh, have grown up with uh, sports. You know, so I have to be very good to learn it. I didn't grow up in the city, which is, uh, which is, um, different kind of experience for an African American uh, in this part of the country these days. I grew up in a small town in Washington before I ever came to the city. And, uh, same type thing. What happening as I was growing up? School was great. Coming to the city um, and seeing uh, a bigger population, say, of uh, black people I had never seen before, and seeing some of the uh, ideas they had about things and experiences that they had about things, uh, I, it took me a while to. What, what's going on? Not that I figured everything out, but uh, you can see, yeah, this is a pretty serious situation. Uh, at Adams High School, we uh, asked about the, the sports thing. Yeah, it's a, a very same thing. For instance, um, uh, the guys, the athletes, say the basketball players. Were, were at, it seemed to be at school mainly to socialize and play basketball. And uh, most guys, uh, you know, 14, 15, 16, who play sports, uh, think they're going to end up on the NBA, uh, making millions of dollars, and being stars, and so on. And, uh, and they've got other problems, uh, too. The distraction and from the business of learning. Yeah. You've seen this stuff. Right. You've seen it. Uh, and so, um, you know, the school, society, parents, everybody, you know, have to figure out what we do. And uh, I don't know if we've had a whole lot of success in that realm uh, up to this point. I mean, it's kind of a mess. Not to mention, you know, the context in which uh, uh, this happens politically, especially when you have something like we have now, we got a headless country, so to speak, um, doesn't help. Um, but yeah, the, um, the um, sports entertainment thing really it really does not help the, the educational process for some of these kids. And especially, uh, oh, should we move the table a bit? Uh, let's see. There, there's a, there's a, uh, if I get in the shadow, then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that? Yeah, that's good. Your expression uh, seems a little murky. Don't hesitate to ask me what I'm totally blind. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that's a that's a that's a big problem. Uh, I have a, as a teacher, uh, as a teacher, uh, you know, I'm interested in learning, exploring for myself and with students and. Uh, I, 
I think that's that's at the heart of the educational process. Um, and um, it gets buried by so many things, especially for some students. You know, students, most students, parents are not educators for uh, And uh, a lot of students, they have only one parent. And I have eight parents. Uh, may have parents who uh, have got some real deficits and problems. Uh, I've seen all kinds of situations. And um, uh, from the best you can imagine to the most extreme, extremely awful that you can imagine. Um, and um, so the Minneapolis, uh, and just, and just generally speaking, <clears throat> it seemed to me that the school was sort of up against it. <laughs> uh, yeah. They, they, they were, up to big success. From what I've read, it almost seems like the Adam system kind of lets students focus less on their academics than other schools. Does that, I don't know, does that sound accurate? Well, I know what you're talking about. Um, I think the, um, the impression that people got, one strong impression people got was just that, uh, that, 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 that wasn't completely, wasn't completely true, but there, there was some truth in Maybe the students had a little bit too much latitude uh, to, Too much latitude in choices. Yeah. Uh, straight a little too far from sort of traditional ways of going about tending to the business of uh, learning. Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say uh, that that was inaccurate. That was one thing that people said about it. Some of the same critique. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, yeah. Or look at the Portland School District. Look at what's been you. Uh, you've heard the talk about the last couple of years. Uh, what's going on with the uh, higher administration uh, and uh, the water thing? Yeah. And uh, some, you know, you've got. <laughs> not all. It's not all the kids. You got incompetent adults too. Right. <laughs> Doing things, and then the school board having its problems. Uh, but uh, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. Seems to be life is a mixed bag. Uh, <clears throat> 
but um, you know, positive experiences. Um, and uh, Adam, uh, there's some great, great students. There's some great students. Uh, and uh, well, that's always a positive experience for me, uh, dealing with students. Um, their um, the variety. Um, great students. Um, the uh, team teaching is a positive experience. Uh, for me, uh, and the people I worked with, like Tom, Tom Swartz and I were on the same teaching team for some years. And Tom's a great math teacher. And uh, we had some other uh, great people on the team. And we're able to you know, work with our, our students pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, and um, some of those students are still friends that we run into you know, uh, in the community. Um, that's a puzzle. Um, the, uh, I'd say a, a, a positive that uh, uh, that um, seems to miss. The school is more than a building, but that was a state-of-the-art building when we walked in. There. I never thought I would be teaching in a facility like that. It was brand new. I never saw it. And we were nailing it a little bit. <laughs> With uh, school started. But it was really nice to have good facilities. Um, that can make a lot of difference. It was, it was, yeah. it was really a nice building. Although later on they just have a radar. Yeah. Uh, during the Whitaker days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it was it was really well equipped. For instance, that was 1969. You weren't even born in 1969. I think your parents might have been born. Yeah, yeah, just about. Yeah. Uh, so the, you know, that was, <laughs> that was it was a really different world, in the digital world that we were in, in the cold brew world. That, uh, 1969, the biggest event in 1969, the moon landing. It was huge. Uh, and yet, still, I mean, um, it was a very, very different world. Um, and we were coming out of, uh, we were coming out of um, one of the um, roughest decades in our um, domestic history, the civil rights movement, and that was very much a part of the picture when Adam started the social unrest, and it was simmering down a little bit. Uh, the social unrest of um, the 60s. Adams started in 1969. Well, in 1968, you know, you had the assassination of Martin Luther King and the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. And I mean, things were really well. And then you had the uh, uh, wild election. Uh, and uh, in, in 68, so that, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, actually, it was an exciting time, but it was, <clears throat> it was a time of great confusion, too. And I think the social unrest, which extended into the school, uh, one, of the, one of the problems at 
and Adams was the racial problem. Um, that, uh, I don't know, got, mag got magnified in the press, but like in the um, report on the, the so-called riot, one of the, one of, one of the stories, one of the rumors was, well, it was a black kid, maybe stand up white kid, or white kid stand up black kid, or uh, no, the kid was an Indian. I mean, there was, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And then, uh, uh, you know how rumor works. You know? Yeah. Um, so that, uh, There was a lot of confusion. Then, another thing that happened, um, um, was that these guys from Harvard, nice guys, civilized people, um, you know, Harvard is Harvard. You going to Harvard when you went to work? Don't plan on it. Okay. A lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, okay, Harvard. Harvard is, you know, the no, uh, number one in American higher education, right? Yeah. You understand that? Right. It's the oldest uh, university in the United States. Started in 1636. Yeah. It was originally the train. Uh, Puritan ministers, um, and you know, a lot of great people go through there. Uh, a lot of great people have gone other places too. A lot of great people have come from those places. Anyhow, but you know, the Harvard label was a big part of the picture of Adams to begin with. Um, and these nice guys, they had. Contacts and then contacts um, because of the, the Harvardness. And uh, so the, that naturally brought a lot of attention to the school. Well, there was this idea oh, we've got this great new high school out in Oregon, uh, in Portland, Oregon and uh, they're, do they're doing something different. Uh, well, one thing that happened from that was, um, I think Newsweek magazine, Newsweek or Time, Newsweek, Newsweek magazine wrote an article about uh, Adam's High School as if it were some great thing. Do you know about that? I haven't read that you one specifically. Yeah. Well, Newsweek uh, wrote this article featuring Adam's and some. As far as I was concerned, educationally, uh, there was nothing remarkable going on. Uh, if you're just talking about students buckling down and having a great educational experience. Um, but uh, this article sort of glamorized uh, the school. Nice magazine. People are being quoted. Oh, that's a students being quoted in the article. Uh, so that one thing that happened, that especially the first and second years, there was this constant stream of people in to look at the school. Yeah. And that bothered a lot of the students. There's always some a couple of teachers from Minneapolis or someplace sitting in the back watching yeah. the, the action. Um, or administrators from all over. And, and they weren't really seeing anything special um, in most cases, I would say. Uh, but um, uh, that was something I remember from that experience. Um, and I thought it was a little unfortunate. And after about three to four years, 
students had a good experience there, I would say, and, but it was, um, but I don't think the school was a great success. Um, I appreciated, I certainly appreciated it as a uh, teaching experience. Yeah. It was really okay. But, um, yeah. Anything else you can think of or would like to hear about? Um, just if you, I don't know, if you've got any other, any other memories that are coming to mind. So we'll see you just think about it. Yeah, the memories are too many to contemplate. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Here's one, here's one thing, uh, I know you hear about the achievement gap, the achievement gap, say, between uh, black students and white students, I don't get tired of but, and, and black students and white students, and then, and then, and then, and then, I don't want to get off of the, the, the big affirmative action thing in education. There's a, some stuff going on right now um, with, the, with, the, uh, with the current administration. Uh, that's going to be with us till the end of time. <laughs> but um, at. Um, At Adams High School, um, one feeling I had as an English teacher, okay, as as somebody who believes in the language and believe, uh, believes in language, <laughs> and uh, um, believes that it's our distinguishing characteristic as beings on the planet. You know, we're the only ones that use language. Uh, it's really important. It's so important that people don't get it. But um, at uh, Adams High School, I was in English. Uh, and I taught regular English classes, including college prep English. Freshman to college prep English. And, um, during uh, the, all the time I was at, uh, at Adams, in my English classes, it's hard for the, me to remember having one African American male student in my regular English classes. I don't remember what. I, I remember um, I did have some girls, but not one male. Um, 
so it says something, and there, and the school was uh, at least 25 percent African American. And that says something about something that's going on in the school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know that's that's uh, sort of like American education. State of American education. What's going on? Uh, it's like um, yeah. Given, especially given the fact that uh, a language uh, is the medium to which uh, we discover our humanity. Uh, and uh, we got people off in the community, in the community or the country. Uh, one of the things that uh, you want is for them to be able to understand each other. You know, I enjoy dialects and all of that stuff, but uh, if, um, if there's a lack of a common understanding of the language and the, especially the works in the language, um, there are going to be problems associated with that. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you can see I've got And your minority groups. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that was one of the main experiences. When, yeah. Uh, how are you doing time wise? Um, I don't have anywhere to be. Yeah. I don't know how you're how you're feeling. Yeah. yeah. A few more minutes. I, yeah. And we've been almost an hour. Yeah. Is this are you are, is this useful to you? Yeah, it's really useful. Yeah. Um Okay, so when you started teaching, what what brought you to Adams? In well, it just seemed like the most teacher friendly school. I mean, the teachers there all were uh, really interested in, in teaching and uh, and the whole system. Uh, also, it was. Well, when I started teaching, I was just in the math department. But uh, some of the teachers were already in houses where they, uh, where they uh, um, would, uh, well, four or five teachers or so, would be a group there would handle a certain number of students. It wasn't until I'd been there a year that they changed to schools within a school, and, uh, and every, every teacher was in a school then. But still, it just, I subbed around the district, trying to find it where I wanted to work, and I was offered jobs at several places, and it was the only one I was interested in. Mm -hmm. So when you were when you were a math teacher at first, we, were you like part of a specific house? No, no, no. I was just. Some of the teachers were part of houses, and some were just, uh, I guess, unattached or something like that. I mm -hmm. unattached. And then were you still unattached in the school within a school? Form? No. Then I then I, you then um, I joined one of the schools. Everybody in the school then, all the teachers, were in one of the five schools. I think it is. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, uh, by that time, the enrollment had gone down to about 800, I think, so I was able to handle that with about 150, 160 in each school. Mm -hmm. What was that like, teaching teaching with a team in the, the school within a school? Great. I mean, teaching with a team is the way to go, I think. I, I did that everywhere. I, do, I did that at teaching at Adams, then when they closed, I went to Jefferson for a while. Then I went to the night program at, uh, at Grant. And there again, we were a team, and we met every day discussing the students. And we did the same thing at Adams. We would uh, meet regularly and discuss plan programs. And we had some classes that were uh, interdisciplinary classes where everybody you know, taught a lot of the same things. Mm -hmm. When you were teaching, were you generally like each person teaching their, their own class, or were you teaching together? How did that work? 
Well, let's see, I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> I know that when I taught the math classes, I would just be teaching math classes, but then I think we had general education classes too, where um, sometimes the whole group would be together and we do activities together, and sometimes we'd have some, our, we'd be responsible for maybe 30 students that we would be following and uh, uh, doing that, but as a, as a whole team. Um, I'm trying to remember what your question was again. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, individual. so I was individual yeah. in the math part of it, yes. Mm -hmm. And and then why did they switch from, from schools within a school to the just general I know it, I know what to call it when they when they got rid of the schools within a school towards the end. You know, I don't really remember them getting rid of the schools in the schools, so <laughs> that's it. That's, uh, All right. It, that was so long ago. Um, it may just have been, no, I, didn't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't remember that happening. Mm -hmm. I know that people still thought it was a team, but I guess maybe it was, maybe, maybe it was. What, when did they switch? Uh, what made you say oh. that? I, I don't remember the year, but it was, I think in the last like two or three years of, of Adams, um, I think enrollment had fallen pretty low. That's true. And so that may be why it, was, it happened. I don't remember that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what are some things that, that stand out to you in your, your memories of your time at Adams? Well, the main thing was just it's, it seemed like a good place to teach and a good place to go to school because um, problems were, that were in other schools, I think, just didn't happen as much there. I guess they did at the beginning. That's where you should really talk to someone who started it because I understand the very first week was quite chaotic. But um, by the time I got there, things were, I thought, rolling on just fine and everybody uh, uh, loved it. Um, some of the strengths of the program, I know we had a tremendous uh, drama department, drama teacher there, just the first teacher there, the drama teacher was just great and had mm -hmm. wonderful students who still, I think a lot of them are still in drama, they just learned a lot. And then when she left, uh, another, that was still a face, then Bruce McDonald came, he did more musicals and he did big scale musicals where anybody who wanted to be in it could be in it. So he had like a cast of 80 people, students and teachers. And so I think the drama part was one of the highlights. Um, boy, you're bringing back things now from a long time ago. <laughs> this was, uh, uh, and what I liked about it was I, I just had, because the enrollment was down, I had small classes and I was able to get, uh, teach really, you know, the, the concepts get across really easily. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I heard that a lot of Adams teachers went to Jefferson. Well, actually, about half of them went to Jefferson, about half went to Madison, I think, because the, those are the two schools that they decided. That's where most of the students are going from, from Adams. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I went to Jefferson. Yeah. Uh, what do you think you can, what do you think the teachers and you kind of brought from Adams to Jefferson when you moved there? Well, I don't know if we brought it or not, but it, it seemed, when I was at Jefferson, it just seemed like, again, the teachers were all dedicated teachers and seemed to work together really well, uh, probably met together a lot. And I don't know if we brought that from Adams or whether the teachers at Jefferson were already like that. Um, I, I can't say. But I know that I basically had a choice between Madison and Jefferson, and Jefferson, again, seemed to be a, a more friendly location to teach in. Uh -huh. And do you, do you remember anything else about the the chaos, the first week? I, I wasn't no, there. I just yeah. Yeah, talked to someone else. They just said basically, I think that they, the people that planned it didn't actually um, know. They didn't have name tags or things like that, so they couldn't tell who was a student who wasn't a student. So, a lot of non-students just showed up, and that's what caused the problem. I think.
But talk to talk to uh, Harold. He was there the first time, or one uh, of the other teachers that began it. Yeah, I'll get in touch with him. He was one of the the Harvard. No, he wasn't no. one of the Harvard ones. That would be Dave Mesero. But um, yeah. um, show me something here real quick. Oh, so 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 it's interesting. The, this year, but here. Hmm. I, I th oh, yeah, yeah. See, this is this is the Alpha School. This is the school I was in. And there's Harold. And um, so these would be the students that were in Alpha School. Would be in this section here. And then East School, Crosby School, Mass School, Haynes. I think the other one was Quincy. What are they? I guess. What are they named after? <laughs> Different things. Uh huh. Glenn Hampshire was a teacher. Uh, Julie Crosley was a teacher. Alpha was just, they just picked the name Alpha. Um, Mez was named after Dave Mesero. And Haynes was yeah, a teacher. So I think basically uh, teachers' names except for Alpha. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, oh, one other thing that happened there. Um, is that one of the teachers there, uh, P.O. Marsupian, Pat Marsupian, started an extended day program so that students, if they didn't want to go to school during the daytime, could go in the evening. And that started at Adams, and it went all the way through Adams. When they closed Adams, it moved, that, that part of the program is the only about the part of Adams that stayed, and it moved to Grant and became the night program at Grant. And then it became the Portland Night High School eventually. So it's where I ended up teaching after about teaching at Jefferson for seven years, then I went over to there. So he started that, and a lot of the other teachers uh, went, when Adams closed, went to that program too. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a part of Adams that kept going behind the closure of Adams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you had taught at the night program? I taught there, the not when I was at Adams. Yeah. It wasn't until I'd, I moved to Jefferson for a while, and then an opening came at the night program, and. Uh, they asked me to come over there. Mm -hmm. So what was that like, teaching at, at the night program? It, again, it was great. Uh, the students, first of all, the students were sort of self-selected. They wouldn't go to school unless they really wanted to be there, going to night school. And a lot of them were there because they were didn't get along in the day program, didn't fit in. Some of them uh, were parents. They had kids by that time. or. Uh, for other reasons, but if they didn't want to go to school, we didn't see them. So the kids all wanted to be there, and so it was a great teaching situation there. Were there some who would just not come? Well, yeah. I mean, they probably dropped out of the day program because they weren't going to school, so they some didn't come to the night program either. But the ones that were serious about it did come to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had two, there were two programs. One was a degree program, and one was a GED program. So. Both those programs there. That program lasted until just a few years ago. I think uh, a couple, three years ago, they finally uh, incorporated it into one of the other alternative programs. Oh, really? That's interesting. And again, it was teaching in a team. You know, we got five teachers and met together every night, and uh, it was just a lot of what happened at Adams. Again, happened in that program. Yeah. That's another program you should look into. It. Do a documentary, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, it's like you know, a rabbit hole. Once you start going, you'll never stop. There's right. so much research to be done. That's true. Um, yeah, do you want to look through the, the yearbooks? Huh? Well, oh, another uh, thing that uh, I'm proud of is that uh, I coached volleyball there, and we won uh, city championship two years in a row there, uh, which I think is the only city championships Adams had in any sports. Oh, so, wow. I, that was oh. good, too. I coached with another teacher, the other coach, the first year, and then I was coaching, I think, on my own the other time. Here I am coaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody, I don't know what, what I can find in here. But again, you can see by 78, you're still in the house, still in schools in the school, Haynes School. Uh, although I guess the te I guess the students are longer put in here by schools. I think they're all 
No, they aren't bad. It's Haynes, Hampshire. Yeah, they're still, still as close here. So what are the students supposed to do? Okay, so this may be when they switched from the, like you said, they switched at the end there because by 79, it looks like we're not in schools in school anymore. So that would be the last 79, maybe 79, 80. It would be the last. Yeah. It might have been one more year after this. I don't know. Milt Adams is still in the area, I think. If you can ever find out how to get a hold of him, Harold might know how to get a hold of him. Or, or Dave Dampke probably know how to get You talk to Dave. Yeah. He might know how to get a hold of Milt. Um, Boy, I remember a lot of these people. <laughs> I wonder where they are now. Any any interesting stories you remember about any of them? Oh, it just there's just a whole lot of memories. I don't know many stories, but mm. I know that uh, um, Linda Gill here was just a tremendous athlete, great golfer, and then she had some sort of disease. Um, I forget what it was now, and it kind of hurt her athletic ability after that time, but that's some just wonderful kids there. There's the volleyball team. Early losses, but we didn't have a good year that year. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't. Can't anything else. You go ahead. If you have any questions for me? Uh, um, I um. I know, just if there's there's anything else that that's coming to mind as you think about it. Uh, no, we. That's really good faculty. I don't know if you know Larry Colton. He taught there for a number of years. He's an author now in Portland. He lives in Northeast Portland. He's not one you might try to get in touch with. He he taught there about four or five years, I think, and then just like, quit to write full time. Um, I just remember it was a wonderful place to teach and wonderful teachers. I just liked them all. Nothing else. That's it? Yeah.